Hi, this is Andy Hoffman, Marketing Director of Miles Franklin Precious Metals in our 28th year of business. It's Thursday morning, July 6, 2017. And the title of this, my 200th audio blog, is America's Monetary Fate Reduced to Idiosyncrasies. Now, yesterday, I declared July 5th Financial Independence Day in an attempt to increase awareness and subsequently motivate action to address the worldwide destruction history's largest, most destructive fiat Ponzi scheme is causing. Not just for us, but our children and grandchildren, who, unless a debt jubilee occurs by decree or rebellion, will be saddled with servicing the largest and with each passing year exponentially increasing debt load in global history. By the last estimate, that load is $217 trillion, unless you include off-balance sheet debt, unfunded liabilities, and the derivatives that leverage them, in which case the real number is easily twice that, or perhaps a lot more. Not to mention that care of history's most insane central bank monetary policy and accompanying market manipulation, both overt and covert, which broadly speaking has produced the dot-com valuations in a Great Depression era that have only benefited the 1% at the expense of the 99%, global interest rates have been suppressed to their lowest ever level despite the aforementioned debt load and the highest ever cost of living, which conveniently is hidden by rigged inflation statistics that never rise above leading central banks' arbitrary 2% inflation bogey. In other words, unless you believe that 5,000 year lows in nominal inflation in nominal interest rates can be sustained, amidst the greatest money printing and debt accumulation sprees in history, with debt servicing, said debt servicing will spiral exponentially higher. Even if, LOL, not a single additional dollar, yen, euro, pound, or yu yuan of debt is incurred. As for said cost of living, the ravenous forces of government-catalyzed inflation are fighting the equally vicious market-based forces of deflation tooth and nail in a lose-lose game of global fiat currency destruction. Regarding the former, there are too many ways to count how inflation is destroying our lives, but the root causes always lie in heinous, self-serving central bank and federal government decisions, which in many cases are one and the same, as in South Africa, which just yesterday proposed to nationalize the supposedly independent central bank, whilst simultaneously proposing to expropriate land without compensation when necessary. Like, for instance, those in Illinois, which may still be downgraded to junk, despite having passed a, quote, budget that will cause all matters of taxation to explode. Or New Jersey, Connecticut, California, or Maine, or Puerto Rico, Greece, Brazil, or India, which in all cases have taken the concept of crony capitalism to new heights, now that essentially all global elections that are still free are won principally by the most bought politicians. Or the U.S. government, due to its unending wars, socialized health care, uncapped entitlement spending, and bridges to nowhere. The European Union or Communist China, the latter of which purports 7% growth when the reality is closer to negative 7%, and hides the vast majority of its debt in state-owned enterprises and shadow banking entities. But don't worry, deflationists, as tax increases and unreported shadow banking rate hikes are not considered inflation increases by government-generated consumer price indexes. As for deflation, which historically has been as supportive to precious metals as runaway inflation, given that under fiat regimes, deflation always yields hyperinflationary monetary policy, dramatic, irreversible secular themes like demographics, automation, and internet-based commerce are inexorably pushing prices lower which in a healthy economy is a good thing, but decidedly not a debt-infested one featuring historically suppressed and thus ripe for surging interest rates. But alas, by far the biggest catalyst of today's unprecedentedly deflationary trends is the money printing, financial engineering, predatory lending, rigged financial markets and economic data, and propaganda produced by the evil troika of Washington, Wall Street, and the fake news media, as well as their... Uh, partners overseas that has enabled the grossest misallocation of capital in global history, both in the U.S. and abroad. Per what I wrote way back when, in January 2015's must-read, direst prediction of all. Just look at, in the U.S. alone, today's historic glut of commercial office space, 
retail locations, automobile inventories, not to mention on a global basis the inventories of nearly all commodities, from crude oil to copper to corn, resulting in a CRB index below that of the lows of 2009. To that end, if central banks had just let natural economic forces play out following when, following when said fiat Ponzi peaked in 2000 and broke in 2008, the damage would have been substantial but manageable and reversible. However, by attempting to usurp economic Mother Nature's laws, by printing limitless currency units, manipulating interest rates in financial markets, and destroying reality barometers like actual economic data and precious metal prices, they have created the most massive oversupply condition in history of commodities, infrastructure of all kinds, debt, which is about to run up against an historically contentious debt ceiling debate, and destructive, counterproductive governments themselves which can only be sustained by additional money printing and financial asset inflation. Assuming confidence in this, history's largest, most destructive fiat Ponzi scheme isn't lost, as unfortunately has been the case with all thousand plus fiat Ponzi's throughout history. As for the world's last remaining, but rapidly declining, superpower, its transforma transformation toward the realm of second world banana republic has been as rapid in speed as dramatic in scope. From the internal wars occurring within its leading political parties, both of whom are at war with the president, to the explosion of fake news dissemination and the witch hunt for the real news that is purported to be fake, political dystopia has reached levels never before witnessed in U.S. history. Geopolitically, it's difficult to conceive that Nobel Peace Prize laureate Barack Obama, who ran on a campaign of reducing America's military entanglements, but wound up dropping more bombs than any other president, could be topped by Donald Trump, who also ran on a platform of reducing military entanglements. However, in just the first five months of his term, he's bombed Syria under false pretenses, inciting, inciting dramatically increased tensions with Russia and Iran in the Middle East, taken us to the brink of war with North Korea, despite no one else in the region having similar ambitions, including nations like China and Russia, which are far more exposed to the conflict, and likely incited Saudi Arabia's leadership of the Qatar embargo that may well have significant geopolitical consequences. Oh, and proposed to allow America's generals to send as many troops to Afghanistan as they'd like. Not to mention the diplomatic feuds he's unilaterally created with, Mer with many of America's closest allies and their leaders from Canada to Mexico, Germany, Australia, and China. And economically, we're amidst the worst growth since the Great Depression. See this week's construction spending and factory orders data and today's ADP employment report purporting zero manufacturing jobs created in June, particularly when real economic data is used amidst the biggest debt edifice, highest level of wealth inequality, and highest cost of living in U.S. history atop an historically hyperinflationary monetary policy that LOL is considered hawkish compared to most of its peers. This is why the Fed has been forced to hold rates at their lowest ever levels and covertly support treasury bonds as buyers of last resort, as clearly occurred last year when the Chinese, Russians, and Saudis started selling treasuries en masse. Just as they and their partners in the president's group on financial markets are forced to support the Dow Jones propaganda average with the daily dead ringer algorithm, as it did yesterday amidst plunging factory orders, auto sales, and crude oil prices. I mean, seriously, this chart pattern, which I first identified five years ago, of prices coincidentally bottoming at the 10 o'clock a.m. timestamp of the Fed's covert open market operations and gra gradually rising th uh, th thereafter throughout the day, has become as ubiquitous as the cartel herald formation that has capped every precious metal rally in the 15 years I've been watching. Which is why this year's craziest Fed gambit of all, coincidentally commencing exactly on election day, is so incomprehensible. Unless, of course, one believes the increasingly light logical possibility that they are purposely attempting to tank the economy and financial markets to hurt Donald Trump personally. Which then again is completely contradictory to the powers that be's maniacal market rigging since election day when said dot-com valuations were created despite crashing economic data, and in recent months, despite the Trumpflation meme that was supposedly the reason for such optimism, having decidedly collapsed. Irrespective of the reason, the Fed's recent actions and statements, as contradictory and ambiguous as ever, but clearly focused on creating the perception of a tightening bias, 
have been more illogical and indecipherable than ever, particularly as the reality of the economic situation is so dire and the reality of their policy is a 1% Fed funds rate with the most hawkish case being 1.25% by year end and a $4.5 trillion balance sheet that may or may not be reduced sometime in the future depending on factors completely at odds with what they have traditionally discussed. Which could not have been more obvious yesterday when the minutes of their June 14th meeting, which I put in quotes given that they're so obviously doctored to account for current economic and financial market conditions, were released. When, in their most keystone Keynesian manner yet, they attempted to, to depict an institution divided by conflicting fears of inflation and deflation. Inflation, which decidedly does not exist in any of the rigged metrics they rely on, or supposedly rely on, particularly now that oil has been declining. And deflation, which not only exists in said statistics, but the fact that most Fed members claim financial conditions have actually eased since it started raising rates 18 months ago. In reality, the only real inflation in the system right now, aside from the aforementioned cost of living increases the government conveniently omits from inflation statistics, is in the stock, bond, and real estate markets. In all three instances, principally due to the explicit and implicit support given them by the Fed itself. Which is probably why a few Fed officials saw equity prices high on standard metrics. And LOL, a few saw low volatility stock risks uh, causing risk disability. I mean, geez, the reason we have low volatility, in fact, historically so, and not just here but overseas as well, is because central bank market intervention has become so ubiquitous, like the dead ringer, that market participants and paper precious metal shorts no longer fear anything. And yet the hawkish Fed, whose recent barrage of imminent tightening statements has caused interest rates to surge from the post-election low on the benchmark 10-year yield of 2.12% to today's 2.37%, which I might add is still below the 2.5% top I called six months ago under the assumption that anything higher than that will decimate what's left of the economy, which in turn has unquestionably damaged the economy further, fueling deflationary expectations and statistics further. In fact, the minutes decidedly did not depict an institution with any degree of hawkish conviction at all, as they, are still, as they still support gradual rate hikes, as in a dot plot, assuming rates do not reach 3%, which is half of the historical average, for another three years, and are divided over when to start the mythical balance sheet runoff. But most alarming of all was the utter cluelessness revealed of the institution arbitrarily deciding America's monetary fate and stating that, or better put, blaming recent softness in the price data on, I kid you not, idiosyncratic factors such as, quote, sharp declines in the prices of wireless telephone services and prescription drugs, which I double kid you not, they expect to, quote, have little bearing on inflation over the medium term. This before espousing that several participants expressed concern that progress toward the committee's 2% longer run inflation objective might have slowed and that the recent softness inflation might persist. And, according to some measures, financial conditions have eased even as the committee reduced policy accommodation and market participants continue to expect further steps to tighten monetary policy. To start, irrespective of the denial causing them to believe such factors are not real or even worrisome in their eternally ambiguous medium term, is as dovish as it could possibly be and thus not in sync with the policy of monetary tightening. Secondly, exactly why would the secular decline in wireless prices be temporary, given that irreversibly so, less and less time is being spent communicating via cell phone, let alone the politically catalyzed decline of pharmaceutical prices, which are under attack by everyone from the socialist Hillary Clinton to the LOL conservative Donald Trump. But most of all, how is it that the most important and powerful money printing institution with a full three weeks to prepare, or edit, its meeting minutes, could come up with no better way to describe the behavior of, of all things, the completely arbitrarily selected markets for cell phone and prescription drug pricing as idiosyncratic. Frankly, this is easily the most ambiguous description I've ever heard from an institution famous for ambiguity, as by definition, an idiosyncrasy means a peculiarity or oddity. I mean, exactly what is peculiar about price declines due to irreversibly, blatantly obvious secular changes, 
like in cell phones now that people are using free services like Skype, Google Hangouts, and various forms of online text messaging. Or in drugs, when the highest ranking politicians are screaming from the top of the lungs that the price gouging of those most likely to vote for them cannot continue. Yes, this is the thinking, judgment, and communication skills of the people issuing, managing, and manipulating the currency in your pocket. Which, unless you're one of the 1% receiving the vast majority of their money printing and market manipulation largesse, have been irreparably harmed in countless ways by essentially everything they've said and done and will say and do until they are done. Not to mention the fact that they've been wrong on everything they've ever predicted, not sometimes, but always, which bodes quite ominously for Whirly Bird Janet's soon-to-be historically infamous statement that we won't see another financial crisis in our lifetimes given that the system is so much safer and sounder than in 2008. Thus, whilst fighting the Fed has been painful in recent years, principally due to the covert market manipulation supporting their statements, it has always been the wisest long-term course to bet against them and all other central banks, particularly as now history's largest, most destructive, and for the first time global fiat Ponzi scheme is clearly in its terminal malignant phase, as evidenced by the aforementioned debt parabola, serially collapsing currencies, imploding global economy, and the exploding political tension and social unrest resulting from the historic wealth inequality caused by central banks' hyperinflationary response to the unprecedented economic collapse they created. This is why history's best central bank fighting weapons, precious metals, are such an invaluable addition today to your portfolio. As aside from having been driven to their lowest ever inflation adjusted levels, the sentiment created by the relentless post-election suppression has gotten so intensely weak, easily the worst I've ever seen, the valuation anomalies that have been created are, for all intents and purposes, unprecedented in U.S. history, such as, as discussed in my Valuation Anomalies article of two weeks ago, the lowest ever platinum gold ratio, the lowest ever numismatic premiums, and nearly the lowest ever silver gold ratio. This at a time when mine production has unquestionably peaked, potentially irreversibly so, whilst despite extremely low demand in the West, global demand has remained close to its highest ever levels. And of course, the pink elephant in the room remains of the razor-thin, above-ground, available-for-sale wholesale inventories that decades of covert and overt government distorting have caused. Not to mention, the global money printing is at an all-time high without the Fed actively monetizing, at least overtly so, as I assure you it eventually will, given the Ponzi-esque nature of the parabolic debt explosion it has caused. Likely sooner rather than later, given that the global economy is amidst a vicious, accelerating depression, whilst the exploding U.S. debt edifice will shortly spontaneously combust if rates aren't brought back down dramatically and rapidly so. To that end, the need to protect yourself from what's coming, financially and otherwise, has never been more urgent. And if your desired protection prescription is precious metals, particularly if you seek the best possible storage options, we humbly ask you to call Miles Franklin at 800-822-8080 or go to milesfranklin.com and register for online purchasing and give us a chance to earn your business. And as always, I can be reached via email at ahoffman at milesfranklin.com. Thanks very much. And of all, just look at, in the U.S. alone, today's historic lot of commercial office space, retail locations, automobile inventories, not to mention, on a global basis, the inventories of nearly all commodities, from crude oil to copper to corn, resulting in a CRV index below that of the lows of 2009. To that end, if central banks had just let natural economic forces play out following when, following when said fiat Ponzi peaked in 2000 and broke in 2008, the damage would have been substantial but manageable and reversible. However, by attempting to usurp economic mother nature's laws, by printing limitless currency units, manipulating interest rates in financial markets, and destroying reality barometers like actual economic data and precious metal prices, they have created the most massive oversupply condition in history of commodities, infrastructure of all kinds, debt, which is about to run up against an historically contentious debt ceiling debate, and destructive, counterproductive governments themselves, which can only be sustained by additional money printing and financial asset inflation. Assuming confidence in this, history's largest, most destructive fiat Ponzi scheme isn't lossy, and accompanying market manipulation, both overt and covert, which, broadly speaking, has produced the dot-com valuations in a Great Depression era 
that have only benefited the 1% at the expense of the 99%, global interest rates have been suppressed to their lowest ever level, despite the aforementioned debt load and the highest ever cost of living which conveniently is hidden by rigged inflation statistics that never rise above leading central banks' as arbitrary 2% inflation bogey. In other words, unless you believe that 5,000-year lows in nominal inflation in nominal interest rates can be sustained amidst the greatest money printing and debt accumulation sprees in history, with debt servicing, said debt servicing will spiral exponentially higher. Even if, lol, not a single additional dollar, yen, euro, pound, or yu yuan of debt is incurred. As for said cost of living, the ravenous forces of government-catalyzed inflation are fighting the equally vicious market-based forces of deflation tooth and nail in a lose-lose game of global fiat currency destruction. Regarding the former, there are too many ways to count how inflation is destroying our leads. But don't worry, deflationists as tax increases and unreported shadow banking rate hikes are not considered inflation increases by government-generated consumer price indexes. As for deflation, which historically has been as supportive to precious metals as runaway inflation, given that under fiat regimes deflation always yields hyperinflationary monetary policy, dramatic, irreversible secular themes like demographics, automation, and internet-based commerce are inexorably pushing prices lower which in a healthy economy is a good thing, but decidedly not a debt-infested one featuring historically suppressed and thus ripe for surging interest rates. But alas, by far the biggest catalyst of today's unprecedentedly deflationary trends is the money printing, financial engineering, predatory lending, rigged financial markets and economic data, and propaganda produced by the evil troika of Washington, Wall Street, and the fake news media, as well as their... Uh, partners overseas that has enabled the grossest misallocation of capital in global history, both in the U.S. and abroad. Per what I wrote way back when, in January 2015's must-read, Dyer's Prediction. Hi, this is Andy Hoffman, Marketing Director of Miles Franklin Precious Metals in our 28th year of business. It's Thursday morning, July 6, 2017, and the title of this, my 200th audio blog, is... America's monetary fate reduced to idiosyncrasies. Now yesterday, I declared July 5th Financial Independence Day in an attempt to increase awareness and subsequently motivate action to address the worldwide destruction history's largest, most destructive fiat Ponzi scheme is causing. Not just for us, but our children and grandchildren, who, unless a debt jubilee occurs, by decree or rebellion, will be saddled with servicing the largest and with each passing year exponentially increasing debt load in global history. By the last estimate, that load is $217 trillion, unless you include off-balance sheet debt, unfunded liabilities, and the derivatives that leverage them, in which case the real number is easily twice that, or perhaps a lot more. Not to mention that care of history's most insane central bank monetary lives, but the root causes always lie in heinous, self-serving central bank and federal government decisions, which in many cases are one and the same, as in South Africa, which just yesterday proposed to nationalize the supposedly independent central bank, whilst simultaneously proposing to expropriate land without compensation when necessary. Like, for instance, those in Illinois, which may still be downgraded to junk, despite having passed a, quote, budget that will cause all matters of taxation to explode. Or New Jersey, Connecticut, California, or Maine, or Puerto Rico, Greece, Brazil, or India, which in all cases have taken the concept of crony capitalism to new heights, now that essentially all global elections that are still free are won principally by the most bought politicians. Or the U.S. government, due to its unending wars, socialized health care, uncapped entitlement spending, and bridges to nowhere. The European Union, or Communist China, the latter of which purports 7% growth when the reality is closer to negative 7%, and hides the vast majority of its debt in state-owned enterprises and shadow banking entities.